bounce the slide? Or is it? I'm good. You're good? Okay. All right. Let's, uh, we seem to have a full house. Wow. Man, the pressure's on. Uh, that's good stuff in the other rooms. Really, it's okay. <laughs> hey. Uh, so, uh, hey, thanks for being here. This is a, an insane, uh, I don't believe that it's better than last year, but it is. That's kind of surprising for those of you. Those of us that were here last year was amazing. So, uh, here you go. All right, I gotta yell. So anyway, <laughs> hey, um, thank you all for joining me for Big Data, APT, and Cyber War. <laughs> no, wrong. Uh, I don't think I use any of those words. So, how screwed are we? Uh, my name is Jack Daniel. If you know who I am, I'm sorry. Um, if you don't, it doesn't matter anyway. I have something to do with B-sides, and I have this job at Tenable, which I put there to remind me to do the classic disclaimer. I do not speak for Tenable. I do not speak for anyone except my dog, and she only backs me up because she wants to ride in the truck when I get home. <laughs> So how screwed are we? So here's a question. I was pondering this. How bad is this situation that we're in with computer security? Are we a handful of little brass screws screwed? Or are we this screwed? <laughs> <laughs> I think most of us would probably guess closer to this. Uh, I'm going to go off track. For the, the biggest show, in, the second largest show in Las Vegas is something called Con Expo. They sell construction equipment. It's, the gear is so big, the cement mixers are in the convention center. The mining equipment and machines like this are out in the parking lot. One year, I was in a 10 by 10 tent in the parking lot trying to sell firewalls. Uh, that went well. Uh, but anyway, so that's where I grabbed that picture. So here we go. Obviously, we know we're screwed. So let's look at some internet stats. Argue about their accuracy. Uh, maybe we'll complain about end users because that's always fun. Um, and then if no one objects too much, maybe let's talk about moving forward a little bit. Uh, and with that, talking about solutions. One of the things I want to do is uh, take a look at the undead things that live in our networks and in our infrastructure. Um, and I love that bumper sticker, so I just had to put it there anyway. Um, because there are a lot of things that have been declared dead by analysts and pundits and people that don't actually defend networks for a living. And this, uh, it's been better at this event. I feel better about this, but I need to make this point. And I apologize for what I'm about to do to you. Our problems are not like this. Neither are the answers. Which is to say that our problems are not black and white. They are not binary. They are shades of gray and often take at least a little while to come into focus. The absolutes that we get in this industry are killing us. Which is an absolute. But, that's, uh, <laughs> but it's me and hyperbole and that's kind of the way I work. Anyway, uh, and there are some things that we all understand, but we make pronouncements and we might agree, but we probably don't. And once we get out to the people that we actually have to reach and sell these ideas to, yeah, it's, it just doesn't work. So let's look at the internet. Um, who saw HD's talk yesterday about scanning the internet? Yeah, good stuff. He's done some amazing stuff. Rob Graham uh, at Errata, some, uh, Fyodor has done this, this phenomenal work scanning the internet. Uh, smarter people than I have done it, uh, harder working people than I have done this. Um, but scanning the internet takes a lot of time, takes effort. HD talked about the amount of data he's collecting and trying to parse it. That's like work. <laughs> um, and, and that's just not for me. Um, I like having a job where I get to like, buy friends drinks occasionally and go out and talk to people. That's cool. Uh, that hard work stuff, we'll leave it to people like HD. So my approach is let's just sniff the internet. <laughs> Now, an observation about sniffing the internet that came quickly is it doesn't all smell very good. As a matter of fact, some of it smells really bad. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes is based on an atypical American family of three. There's myself, 
I work from home, so when I am not on the road, I'm in my house with my lab. I run a small lab of that company's gear, and uh, so occasionally competitive gear. And I'm sitting at my desk 10 to 14 hours a day like all of you do. My son uh, is home a few hours a night because he has a horrible commute, but he's also a network security guy. He works at the company I used to. He is a gamer and anime fan, and that becomes important in a minute. Uh, and my wife uh, is the intelligent one of the three of us. She delivers mail for a living. She hates the internet. She has an ancient Motorola phone uh, on Nextel, you know, the indestructible ones. She's uh, just cowering at the thought of having to get a new phone next year when Nextel find, when Schmidt pulls a plug on us. Her goal is to be completely off the internet within two years. When she uh, resigns the re union post she's held, she's going to be off the internet. So they're basically two people on the internet and they're power users. Uh, tools. This is not about the tools that were used. Some of you can guess some of the tools that I use to do this. They're not impossible to get, but it's not about the tools. Uh, there are different ways to do that. For a lot of what I'm talking about, there uh, are two tools that will make this easy for you. Tool one, uh, P0F, uh, has started to be maintained again. So you can do some OS detection and other things. You can find old things with that by sniffing. The other one is whatever IDS you're comfortable with and can write signatures for. Um, and they don't have to be uh, convoluted because it's mostly graphic text. So I sniff traffic. I sniff the traffic. I put a sensor outside of my firewall, outside of my gateway, between the gateway and my cable modem. Cable modem is important because there's all sorts of noise that bounces off the firewall in a cable environment. So I got a little more noise from that. Uh, but a lot of this is based on banner grabs. Banner grabs, believe it or not, are not 100% accurate, so I'm disclaiming that right now. They're false positives in here. So, let's crunch some of my numbers. Um, what, this isn't what you use to crunch numbers? Um, it's, I actually leave my slide rule hanging off the network rack in my office at home. Um, wow, that's completely white out. Oh, well. So let's crunch some numbers. Let's start out taking a look at, I'm, I'm breaking out all the analytic tools for this. I mean, HD's got his Mongo, whatever. I got out like both of my typewriters. Uh, what's that number on there? 632,406 unique IP addresses, not host names, not URLs, in a nine month period, sniffed on the outside of my gateway. 632,000, granted not a normal family. 632,000 IPs, not OCs. That's a lot of damn boxes. Okay, if we take out the 398,000 that we only contacted by way of BitTorrent, <laughs> uh, we still have 234,000 IPs that we interacted with. That's nuts. So we can figure my son is a network engineer. Some of his BitTorrent traffic is probably encrypted and didn't get picked off. I use Skype for podcasts all the time. Skype is a bit of an interesting, if you're a network guy and have never watched Skype trying to get out of your network, you should give it a try. It's kind of cool. Picture taking a giant Norway rat out of the streets of New York. Stuffing it full of crack and putting it in a room with one small hole it needs to find. It's just, <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of noise, but no matter how we slice this, that's still a lot of IPs. Let's boil this down further. What's, what would be interesting? Maybe web servers. 14,934 devices based on IP serving websites. That's quite a bit. Oh, we have to do a little disclaimer here. That first disclaimer, double, triple applies now. I'm not speaking for anybody. Uh, word on risk ratings, and particularly CVSS scores. Uh, tell me, Mommy, where do CVSS scores come from? Does anybody know? <laughs> uh, CVSS scores are subject to interpretation. The organization generating the scores has some guidelines. Um, and you can steer them based on whatever your agenda is. So for example, if you use CVSS score to determine that payment card industry 
compliance, I won't utter the letters, um, you would drive a lot of CBSS scores higher so that you would trigger a failure of that particular standard. Whereas if you did that compliance by a separate set of pass-fail, you would probably give it a lot lower. So those numbers are all over the place. I'm just saying, here's more numbers I don't have a lot of faith in. Uh, one of the things, though, is even with that explanation, uh, sometimes I think people pull some of these numbers out of their ass. <laughs> so um, I refer to these as rectilinear. For anybody that's a geometry major, there's recti, R-E-C-T-I, rectilinear, and that's parallax. It's rectilinear, and that's the classic case is lenses that compensate for, you know, the, the point that buildings look pointy when you stand at the bottom. If you change that I to an A, rectilinear, straight out of your ass. Uh, this is also called ponemon, I mean, um, no, uh, semantic, no. Uh. Anyway, 4,364 that by a fairly conservative measure, IPs with medium or higher volumes, things that are, this is not replay sort of stuff. This is an actual vulnerability. 1,773 that are at or near hair on fire level of vulnerability. Five, yeah, high tech stuff, right? I'm digging out all, all the high tech stuff. 523 IP addresses of web servers with publicly available exploits. And I'm talking Mostly Metasploit, although some of these are core, some of these are Canvas, some of these are exploit DB, but you can grab an exploit publicly. 523 IPs, it's not a lot out of 15,000, but again, this is people that avoid bad places on the internet off of our pipe or like pop out other places and that traffic's encrypted so we don't see it. Um, and here's one of those embarrassing things that happens to us. Uh, I had to admit that my OPSEC was poor, though, because I'm too lazy to scan, and I'm too lazy to do some things, and I try, but, um, you know, validating some of this stuff would require doing things beyond port scanning. And uh, my friend Bob apparently hacked into me and copied all of my research data. It's embarrassing to have to admit this publicly. But there is a good side to this because Bob was overcome with guilt. And then to make up for it, he shared some active scan data that he got from a VPS somewhere in Moscow. <laughs> so I get this, uh, this in a Dropbox thing. 68 IPs exploitable, 50 of them are in Metasploit. That's still not a lot, but that's, we'll get to why that's actually a lot. And uh, as I was packing up Wednesday night, I, I get another message. Um, changed the scan around, found 86 hosts that are vulnerable, publicly available exploits. Every one of them's in Metasploit, so we've now raised the cost of this to your time. We've uh, raised this to, uh, wow, that's pretty bad. And again, these are not things that require, like the SSL script. This is not man in the middle. This doesn't require being in a pipe. This is, I'm here, it's there, I can pop it. Um, let's dig into these numbers a little bit more. Let's throw all our crap in the car. This one stands out. This is EC2 instances with EC2 in the DNS name. So doing a reverse lookup. 23. It's not a lot out of 15,000 IPs. But if it has EC2 in the DNS name, it's probably a spot instance. But we know that no one would ever just throw insecure crap on Amazon exposed to the public well, except that how many of those 23 reported exploitable vulnerabilities? Every damned one of them. It's okay, though, because these have to be like spot instances, and they can't still be up, right? Uh, there are eight of them that anybody here, even if I haven't used Metasploit seriously in a year plus, we can... So the reason I say it's got to be a spot, you would, like, DNS is kind of important. Don't let Kaminsky know that, because we'll never hear the end of it. But uh, <laughs> DNS is kind of important. So if we're not fixing DNS, these things shouldn't be exposed. But it, you know, they, maybe they're development servers, because nobody ever attacks development servers. It's all right. Uh, some unreliable internet demographics. These are uh, Apache, as you might expect, is uh, the uh, most common 
Uh, server, 4,000 out of the set. Where it gets interesting, uh, oldest uh, of the one tree, 1331, which came out in 2004. Uh, 2046 came out in May 2003. <coughs> That's pretty old. Nah, somebody could be lying about these banners. Um, I could see lying about a little bit off. I wouldn't lie about this because you're painting a bullseye or something. Uh, Engine X. A lot of, or a handful of vulnerable Engine X, and I doubt that those are people that are doing as much uh, creative stuff, but about uh, 2200, the oldest of them, November of 2007. Uh, I haven't tried them myself, but supposedly the Nginx uh, exploits that are available are fairly reliable. Uh, IIS, 1,600 of them or so. Uh, oldest version is 5, but that's okay because I'm sure they're fully patched, those Windows 2000... Uh, <laughs> uh, Lighty, 142 of those, the oldest of them. One of them's got a bogus banner, which I don't really trust, but I'll say April 07 is probably the oldest of those. Uh, and then uh, just the PHP, um, I, I believe that somebody's running PHP that hasn't been updated since 2004, because let's face it, that's uh, PHP. Uh, most horrifying Apache ID, Apache 1.1 Windows 4.000. Oh, oh, oh. uh, one of the good things was this is really nothing to worry about because Bob's results came back to me, and it's really fine because that's actually Apache 1.1 on a Debian 5.0 box. And Debian in 5, well, all right, it's not as bad as if it was in T4, okay? It's, uh, other banners, things were interesting. There's one machine in my house that was a Trend Micro uh, endpoint protection client. It hit 323 different IPs in the process of checking things over nine months. Uh, Amazon S3. A lot of people apparently use Amazon to store stuff on the web, because 848. Akamai G Host. Almost 300. Think about the significance of 300 IPs that are Akamai hosts, because that's a quarter of the internet hiding behind 300 IPs. Uh, Google Front End 11, Windows Azure Blob, which may be truth in advertising, three of those. Uh, and if anyone here is responsible for the two Lotus Domino uh, things on the internet, I, I'm sorry. Uh, there are a lot of good companies hiring. You should talk to people while you're here and get out of that hell. <laughs> Uh, there are some amusing banners. Commodore 64. Uh, I kind of doubt that. Uh, there were some others that I doubt, and uh, the clip art, whatever, the, uh, the art that I came up with wasn't the greatest. Apple Share IP. Anybody remember that? Um, perhaps that's not the best art. If you think that's bad, though, this one is worth Apple iDisk Server. iDisk, you get it? Um, that could be legitimate. Yeah, I, I know. What's worse than a bad pun is a visual <laughs> pun. More amusing banners. This one is the one I call the Larry Pesci Memorial uh, banner. Go <laughs> name. That's what she said. The Gibson. The answer is 42. And obviously an attrition fan, Temple of Squirrels. Um, the winner of the clever banner most likely to backfire is... <laughs> That's really clever if you happen to be scanning and have a table called server types. Unless they figure it out and get mad. <laughs> or unless they're using a flat table, non-database, and see that. And the first thing some people would think was, I'm going to hammer the shit out of that. <laughs> not me. Bob chose not to share findings about those. Uh, so, back to the really screwed stuff. Um, many of those IPs are CDNs, Content Delivery Networks, Cloud Service Providers, other acronyms. So, in, as in the case of the Akamai stuff. Depending on the service you get from Akamai and other cloud, uh, Content Delivery Networks, some of their single IP addresses represent an entire chunk of their client base for a certain content delivery service. In other words, there can be hundreds of thousands of URLs that will respond to a single IP. That kind of scales this problem back up from the number of IPs. Um, no web app scanning. Bob did not fire up any active, any tools 
to look for cross-site scripting, any of the stuff we look for. No fuzzing, none of that. This is network type application, you know, web server and OS things. Uh, no default credential checks were done for these yet, although Bob says that may be running in Moscow now. Um, and if we stop and think about that, if you really are running two, three, four-year-old Apache or Nginx or IIS 5, um, I'm sure that the reason you haven't updated the web server software is because you have been so busy making sure there's no SQL I in it. <laughs> You're, you have just been overwhelmed making sure there are no logic flaws, no bugs, no scripting errors. And, you know, that's okay, because you've got that, uh, maybe not. Uh, a couple of things about the data. Um, a lot of the questionable requests at my house don't get back into the network. So the sensor was outside the firewall, so those requests that came back to me, it saw. If a content <laughs> filter, SSL proxy, whatever, dropped it, it was seen. The subsequent requests from those potentially malicious or questionable sites was never made. So this is actually an artificially clean data set. HTTPS proxy, so in doing, doing typical proxy stuff, no self-signed certs were ever allowed in, no uh, way off protocol stuff was allowed in. And uh, by the way, my picture of a firewall is more accurate than the ones I've seen in any network diagram because I've seen how you people configure firewalls. <laughs> uh, worked in that business for a while, I've seen how that works. Uh, but anyway, so there's that. What time is it? 2.20. Shit, I'm not out of time. <laughs> ah, I can stall more. Um, I don't know. How about a story? Some of you have heard this. I apologize. I don't care. This is one of my favorite stories in the world. It's not one of my stories, but it's an acquaintance of mine. One of the hobbies I don't have time for is blacksmithing. I like to put things in the fire and hit them with a hammer. <laughs> um, it's great fair. I do this. People come up. Mom, Dad, and the kids are there. What are you making? I have a piece of metal. I put it in the fire. I take it out. I hit it with a hammer. Why the hell do I have to make anything? <laughs> right? Dad tries not to get caught laughing. The kids burst out laughing, and Mom rolls her eyes. Um, and sometimes it's the other way around, but it's, you know, one of the parents tries to play it straight. But, uh, Peter Ross, this guy is an interesting character. He's a real nice guy. He is retired from his gig that he had for decades. He was the master blacksmith at Colonial Williamsburg. Interesting place because unlike a lot of living history museums, you can't go in the back room, fire up the grinder, the welder, the lathe. What they do in front of you with the equipment that they use and the stock they use is how they make things. So he was a master at this point in time, some would argue journeyman, but he was an accomplished blacksmith at Williamsburg when they renovated one of the original dwellings that was in Williamsburg. One of the door locks was missing. It had been for a long time. They renovated the house. They brought him a door lock. This is a cheat because some of these pieces are obviously machine. <coughs> They needed a duplicate door lock, key to light, of this style to be put in a 17th century dwelling, and it needed to be right. He's not allowed to use welders or anything. He's got to do it the right way, and he's one of the masters of it. And he's, to, to this day, if you need something that looks like it belongs in Colonial Williamsburg or Plymouth, Massachusetts, or London, or Paris, he gets work from overseas. Phenomenal. But he took the lock apart, measured everything. Notes, sketches, drawings, measurements. Went to the stockpile and started assembling the, what he would need, made all of the pieces. Put it together, and nothing fit. Checked the measurements. They were all pretty much right on, but, you know... Blacksmithing involves a piece of metal, in this case wrought iron, to be traditionally accurate, which is very granular. It actually looks like wood. If you see old if you see old wrought iron, you'll see it actually looks like wood. It's got so much grain, and that's the silica in it that makes it strong. That grain also means it kind of goes where it wants to. So anyway, he's, he gets it, he reworks piece by piece by piece, and finally gets the thing assembled after days of reworking it. Cool thing about, you know, 
iron is that you can kind of push things around. You can move the holes. Finally got it all together. He was so thrilled about himself. I believe he actually said it was like a kid bringing something home to mom to put on the refrigerator. Everybody came in for weeks. They showed this thing to him. It worked perfectly. They were psyched. He was gone for like a three-day week and came in. Picked it up. Picked up the original. Looked at it. His had all sorts of tool marks all over the front of it and the back of it. The holes had been moved. It had been worked and worked. Looked at the other one, smooth. Looked at it again inside, smooth. So they had this revelation. And this comes to skill, which is a conversation we have with ourselves about skill. How's that possible? They're the best people at what they do in the world at this time for that style of blacksmith. Logical conclusion. They're not as good as they were centuries ago. It took him almost a decade to realize that he was completely wrong. That he was applying a modern engineering construct to a traditional assembly method. If you build this lock and you want this lock to work, and you are working in traditional materials, you take a piece out of the scrap pile that forms the back plate. And that's where you start, and you get it close enough. And then you pick one more piece that will be one of the top, bottom, side rails. And you make that piece fit what is before. And then you take the next piece and it has to fit the first two. And when you get down to the fiddly bits in here, yeah, you need to do some filing, you need to be careful. But it'll look pretty much, the, it'll, it'll look the same here. It won't look the same here, but it'll look the same here. It'll look the same on that door and that door. The keys will work the same. The thing is, that unless you have engineering level precision, machining level precision, it makes more sense to take a piece, build a foundation. Each piece that you put on top after that foundation has to fit the foundation and what you've built on top of that. So the point of this story is one, that's a great story if you can't sell somebody on some idea with that story, I don't know what to tell you, but two, in our environment, one of the things that we often see is we buy an engineered solution and expect it to fit. And I don't care where you are, your network, your environment, your code, I don't care how much of your code you stole from somebody else, the next piece of code needs to fit that. The next application needs to fit that base. The next piece of network gear has to play nice in your environment. What we do has to work together. That's half of our battle. Anybody that has, like me, done support for a vendor that plugs things into Ethernet or fiber has spent an enormous amount of time dealing with compatibility issues. We do that to ourselves by not thinking about that in advance. So some deep thoughts. What if we divided the information security space into three buckets? One bucket each for the problem space, the solution space, and the solution deployment space. And we're going to fill each bucket to differing levels to represent how complete our understanding or deployment is. So if we were to break it down, here, I'm sorry the contrast worked really well. Let's say this is the problem space. Some people might think this is legitimate. We probably defined half of it because every day we're finding new vulnerabilities. Every day we're finding new bugs. Every day we're finding new ways. Every now and then we take a big jump up with a new class of vulnerabilities. Those are slowing down. The solution space, how many of those problems can we solve? We have protocol problems that we can't solve. We're behind. And there are people that believe, you know, I, I think everybody would agree that the solution deployment is going to be the, the poorest out of everything we're doing. I'd like you to at least entertain the idea that that's wrong. Um, the idea that the problem space is pretty well defined. And the, our knowledge of the solution space might actually be better defined than the problem space. But the real problem is that our deployment of what we've known to do, if you saw Bruce's talk this morning, he talked about, he showed password notes from the 80s, he showed other things from, he talked about stuff that he didn't put up from the 70s. A lot of these problems have been defined. For this to make sense, I will admit a couple of things. For this to make sense, we have to talk about broad definitions. I have to say, this is authentication, this is authorization, this is input sanitization, you know, in broad terms. But no matter how you do it, what we come back to is 
we're not deploying what we know how to do. Any of you that have looked at somebody's code, if that's what you do, looked at somebody's network, know that we're not, we're not covering what we need to do. One of the things that we in this community often forget, though, is there's a reason for that that's valid, and sometimes the cost is simply too high. Or a better way to look at it is the value is too low. There's, we don't get the value out of it. So let's go back to talking about answers. I know we'll just buy them because <laughs> I'm going to ask the vendors for unicorns. Um, I, I worked for vendors for the past five years in vendor space after many, many years as an administrator, security consultant. The problem is even the best vendors can't solve our problems for us. So we asked for unicorns. Look, let's be honest, a pug on a pony is freaking awesome, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's stuff that you can buy on the show floor at RSA or other big trade shows that's awesome gear. If it's not useful in your environment, if it doesn't fit what's there, if it doesn't make sense in your environment, it's a waste of time and money. So let's uh, move a little bit farther forward. So I want to get away from the idea that we have to really, I don't want to say we don't need to innovate because the innovation needs to be in making things easier. The innovation needs to be in making things less painful. The innovation needs to be an automation so that those of us, here's a question I ask everywhere I am, who here works with too large a team of qualified people? Great. <laughs> we need to automate what we can so that those of us that care can pay attention where we have to. This is impossible. Security can't be done. It's like trying to nail del jello to a tree. That goes back to the thinking outside the box. Here's the reality. Nailing jello to a tree is fucking easy if you think inside the box. <laughs> and I don't like lemon jello anyway. Um, so back to back to actual, you know, moving forward. Here's a carburetor shop in uh, Savannah, Georgia. Somebody needs to talk me out of moving to Savannah, by the way, but that's another conversation. Um, that's seen better days. But the tech is not obsolete. It's become specialized. If you can massage carburetors, you've got a skill that's still valuable. The, the new Chevy or Hyundai or Honda or whatever you buy does not have a carburetor anymore. But that technology has value in some places. It may be in motorcycles. It may be in high performance. It may be in vintage and antiques. Uh, one thing I have to do, disclaimer, some people hate automotive analogies. I spent many years as a mechanic. This is one of many Holly uh, jet kits that's in my house. I can use my automotive analogies if I want. I still know how to use those. Um, so we talked about zombies a little bit in the beginning. And what do I mean by zombies? We have things that have been declared dead by people who make a lot of money from giant companies that start with G and other places. Uh, yes, is still not dead. That IDS technology that Steen and declared dead, what, 10 years ago or whatever now? That IDS technology, that idea of looking at stuff on the wire as it goes past a sensor, gave me data on 632,000 IPs I looked at at my house. Huh, some of that's actually interesting information. Maybe it's not quite dead. Antivirus, although we're not supposed to call it antivirus anymore, it's endpoint protection, it's EPP. <laughs> if you've if you're on a big Windows network and you got a bunch of legacy apps and you're still running XP, I defy you to not have some sort of desktop antivirus on. Okay. Uh, firewalls. Firewalls are dead. We can beat a firewall. Yes, you can beat a firewall. Um, proxies. Proxies were popular and weren't. And Palo Alto's making them again. So we're going to call them next gen firewalls. We're going to do different levels of analysis. But we're not going to grow the balls to do SSL inspection unless somebody makes us do it because that's a pain in the ass with the certs and. Web app firewalls, we can beat those. Uh, user training, there's a whole nother one. This goes back to Crit Ramp. Dave Itell is smarter, has done more for the community, more for InfoSec than I ever will. Dave, you rock. You're completely wrong about user training because it was a binary to him. User training doesn't work. It doesn't solve all of our problems, so don't do it. Anybody that has ever run a network and had the bad day and thought, there are two out of 150 people I don't have to worry about this morning, and one of them I can call and tell her what's happening on the network while I fix it. Did it solve the problem? No. Did it make 
my job easier? Yes. Did it make it faster to recover? Yes. Okay. It doesn't solve the problem. We're not in an industry where we solve problems. So we need to make our own zombie army. Wait, wrong zombies. That looks like marketing people. <laughs> um, so we have to keep all of these zombies. We have this ancient tech we have to keep. Let's use it. Let's come back to Valley. Here's where I completely agree with people. Zombie armies should be cheap. They're dead. You know, there are a lot of people out there who are not using their brains. Food is readily available for them. <laughs> Same goes for antivirus, endpoint protection, um, whatever you're using. It's got to make sense. I mean, if you're paying 50 bucks a seat per year for antivirus, you're doing it wrong, right? Um, unless it's a lot more than antivirus. It's like, we pay too much for firewalls. Well, the firewalls, uh, right, they don't exist anymore. They're required. It's firewalls in Astaro, or it's a Sophos, or a Palo Alto, or a Fortinet, or one of those that properly configured does a lot more than drop packets. It might be worth it. It might not, but you have to make that judgment. And here's where we back it up. If you only read one report, no matter what role you're in, the, uh, the Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report gets better year after year. Good report. It's one of those that I put on paper every year and scribble on. The other two there, the Mandy and M-Trends Report and the Trust Wave Report, I download and read, but the, the Verizon. Interesting things. M-Trends, I mean, you call them when you have the, the A acronym thing, right? So that's, this is a very A acronym report. They talk about what you should do for remediation. For remediation, you should do things that these guys talk about in prevention and remediation, and these guys talk about in prevention and remediation. Crazy stuff. You're not going to believe what they suggest. They suggest segmenting your network. They suggest reviewing access control rules. They suggest enforcing logical password policies. Uh, they suggest egress filtering. They suggest crazy stuff. They suggest looking at your ID. They suggest, get this, looking at your logs. Crazy <laughs> shit. Just crazy shit. Um, and one of the things that drives me nuts is I have been told by various people in various things, when talking about the firewall or when talking about IDS or talking about endpoint protection, oh, that's easy. <coughs> okay, are you doing it well? That's easy. Okay, are you doing it well? Finish. <clears throat> um, so here, let's talk about a, a, just an idea. This is not an original thought. But this came to me as I'm looking at my data. We've got firewalls. We have clients with traffic going through the firewall. We can get web service data. You can take Snort, Suricata, bro, whatever IDS, you can figure out how to make it. Hey, look for this text string. Copy and paste a whole bunch of times for every variant of Apache that you can find. <clears throat> start out simple and start kind of filtering it and look at what web servers are going on. That web vulnerability data. Let's make some assumptions. If you're running ancient Apache, you probably have not had a really good code review on the web apps running on that thing. What if you integrated that data into things? I mean, we, we do this in some extreme cases. People actually tie IDS data to firewall rules. People have written scripts and other things to like, when this attack triggers, we're going to write something to IP tables. And what if we did something with that, like, depending on what your scenario, whatever magic box could integrate, uh, you could lower the IE trust zone. You could do something with that data. It's information we already have. We're not using it. Um, there's some problems with this. <coughs> we can get into the spam blacklist problem. The reason I like this idea, though, because it's based on your traffic. It's based on your environment. We're not going to blacklist a site you never go to, and we're not going to tell somebody else about it. Yeah, you're going to block some people that really aren't vulnerable. Um, but it's a low impact. It should be a low cost fix. There must be dozens of these we're missing. Back to the absolutism. If you are the guy, I just lost my silly. There it is. Look at that. If you are the guy right there in the blue shirt and somebody wants you dead, you're dead. Oh, 
By the way, if I always travel with uh, dry erase markers and use them on windows and mirrors when I'm traveling, because sometimes it just works to have a whiteboard. Here's the trip, though. Uh, if your significant other uh, pays for the room with a corporate or other business entity credit card, and uh, he or she comes back and sees that you've drawn this and figures out what you were doing, uh, and it may be in our nation's capital, and uh, I had to crop that picture to leave a federal building out of it. Uh, that doesn't always go over well with the spouses, but that, you know that was by far the not the worst I did this year. Um, <laughs> so let me find that and come back here. So um, yeah, I'm rambling on. The worst I did this year, uh, I've mentioned B-Sides. B-Sides Las Vegas is now a nonprofit corporation of the state of Nevada. We filed our 501c3 federal filing. They're in the process of doing that. Here's one to try on your spouse or significant other. Hey, honey, I got good news from my lawyer in Vegas today. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, back to this. You're dead. Boom. Bad B-movie. The bullet hits you. You're dead. Does waking up to the radio crackling that you're about to be run over by a freighter in heavy seas, only 50 miles offshore off of Long Island, not exaggerating, there were three of us on that 42-foot boat. It was, um, it was very lucky that we survived this trip. Does the fact that should that happen, I would be dead, change the way I drive in Boston? It does not. I still watch YouTube videos on my, no, uh, I still pay attention. I still put on my seatbelt. Don't die from something dumb. Don't fall to dumb stuff. Look, if you're going to feed internet criminals, feed the clever ones, not the dumb ones. Right? Let's, let's, uh, um, and with that, I went through that pretty quick, but this is where we are. Again, the mechanic bit. The spiral screw extractor kit. It's our job to unscrew ourselves. <laughs> right? We need to unscrew ourselves. One of the ways we unscrew ourselves, even though we make fun of the fact that there's a con every week, and I may take some responsibility in that with the B-side stuff that we've done, um, if we share actual information here, that helps. If we share contacts and we actually move forward, if we just drink bourbon and fall over, that's okay. That's a whole other problem. Um, but there. So that once again, this is not an overtly technical talk, but there's some actual stuff that I thought was kind of interesting. 15,000 IPs of web servers. And they're just pop up. Um, Bob did not own any of the boxes. Bob scanned 130,000 boxes in China and found really amazing things. The, if you go and look for bad, you will find it. We all know that, right? What, what struck me about this data set was that this is, these are people who don't go to internet gambling sites. These are people who don't surf sketchy porn sites. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are people who take some precaution. Because my wife, her approach to email I'm not sure about that email, so I just deleted it. Flat. If it comes from friends and family, it probably gets deleted before reading. So, you know, there's very little. So this is a cautious family, fairly high traffic, obviously, but we have data that's relevant to my network at my house. And the amount of effort involved to replicate this, yep, few weeks worth of work if you're, a week's worth of work, I would bet, if you're comfortable with an IDS system. Uh, a few weeks worth of work if you're not, because we're looking for text strings, so it's not going to be that hard to figure out. Uh, where's the commercial solution? Somebody should, like, bundle this into something. Um, it would have to be a company that does active things. I know of one particular company that doesn't like to interact with the network. They like to provide information and let you do it, because... They we want you to screw your own network up, not us. Uh, but <laughs> there have to be other ideas like this. There are. There are people in this room that have better ideas than that. So that's what I've got. It was all over the place. I appreciate your patience. Anybody have questions, comments, ideas? Uh, anything?
Congratulations on uh, 501c3 with Vegas. Thank you. That was, uh, that's it. Hey, honey, I got good news from the Vegas attorney, but I got to send him another check. Uh, so, with that, if you've got questions, comments, whatever, throw them at me. I will continue to gather this data. It'll end up in blog posts and other places. There will be more data. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting that I'm too lazy. To, I'm, not, I'm not HD. I mean, let's, let's be honest. There aren't a lot of people that are HD. Um, <laughs> I'm lazy. And I, hey, look at this. Look what I can do. Um, and it just led me down this rabbit. It also made me think about the, the way we deploy what we know. And yes, your firewall is not going to stop the determined attacker. I spoke to a company which is neither a customer, client, whatever, of any current or past employer. So I won't name the company, but they were looking for a solution to data loss that involved putting something, ideally a pizza box, with LEDs in the rack. <laughs> And it was going to solve sensitive IP loss. Um, after our conversations, I discovered the way they lost the bulk of their sensitive IT in the last major breach was in a briefcase. <laughs> if any of you has an idea for a pizza box with LEDs that I can plug fiber or copper into and solve that problem, let me know I'm investing. I don't have a lot of money, but whatever I've got, I'm giving you, because that's pretty much oil. Can't involve firearms. You don't have security cameras. It involves something that is a rare commodity. Uh, and this is a conversation I should have been when I used to support web filtering. Web filtering is a technical solution to a people problem. There is this rare commodity called management skill. <laughs> which deployed properly does some amazing shit. Uh, with that, questions, comments, booze, jeers, otherwise we're uh, five minutes ahead of uh, wrapping up on the time. With that, thank you all very much. Oh, my God, sorry. Sorry. One more. Yeah, I set it up. Thank you.